Okay, today is June 14th, 2014. Okay, we'll begin with the homage to the Buddha. Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sammasambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato arahato sammasambuddhasa Namo tasa bhagavato Arahato Sammasambuddhasa okay, Good morning, everybody. Okay, so today we'll be taking Sutta number 117 in the Majjhima Nikaya. This is called Maha Chattarisaka Sutta, which means the Discourse Sutta on the Great Forty. And why it's called the Great Forty that we see when we get to the end of the Sutta. And this Sutta is particularly interesting and important in understanding something about the history of the development of the Buddhist text. Because we can see in this sutta how certain elements of the evolving or the emerging Abhidharma found their way into the sutta Pitaka. And then there have been comparative studies done between the Pali version of the sutta, the version preserved in the Chinese Madhyama Agama, and then some Tibetan counterparts or versions of the sutta preserved in the Tibetan language. And from this, by comparison, we could see which version represents an earlier stage, which version represents a somewhat later stage. And interestingly, though, the Pali tradition says that the Pali suttas are the oldest, most authoritative sources. But we could see, actually, that that's not completely the case, that the Chinese version of the sutta seems to be older, sort of more archaic than the Pali version, which is showing, as I said, the influence of Abhidharma modes of thought. And a very important and illuminating comparative study of this sutta with its parallels has been done by a monk who used to be my student but now is sort of miles ahead of me. This is Bhikkhu, miles ahead of me as far as scholarship goes. This is Bhikkhu Analayo. He has a book called Madhyama Agama Studies. These are studies based on the, primarily on the Chinese Madhyama Agama, but comparing the Chinese Madhyama Agama versions of a number of suttas with the Pali versions, versions preserved in some cases Buddhist hybrid Sanskrit, some versions preserved in the Tibetan language. The show that shows how different early, different schools of early Buddhism have preserved what is essentially originally the same text but as the schools separated, the texts underwent variations. Some have been, let's say, have preserved earlier versions, and some versions show the influence of the later evolving or emerging modes of thought. Okay, so let us go directly into the sutta. Okay, so the sutta begins when the Buddha is living at Savati in Jeta's Grove, in Atapindika's Park. He calls the attention of the monks, and then he says, monks or bhikkhus, 
I shall teach you noble right concentration with its supports and its requisites. Listen and attend closely. And then the Buddha raises the question, what is noble right concentration with its supports and its requisites? And it turns out that the supports and requisites of noble right concentration are right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, and right mindfulness. So to these, the enumeration of these factors from right view to right mindfulness give you some indication of what's being expounded here? Exactly. It's the Noble Eightfold Path, but it's now being presented from a somewhat different perspective. It's now taking right concentration as sort of the core or center of the Noble Eightfold Path. And then the other seven factors are, we say, are like Maybe you could say that right concentration is like the sun of the solar system and the other seven factors are being presented as planets around that central sun of the solar system. So those are the supports and the requisites. And then right concentration itself is called unification of mind equipped with these seven factors. So that is right concentration with its supports and its requisites. So here we're having a somewhat different perspective on the path than we get from some of the other suttas which speak about how right view arises first, from right view comes right intention, and right speech, right action, right livelihood culminating in right concentration. But here we are dealing with the experience that emerges, <coughs> that occurs when right concentration has reached a certain peak of development, peak of maturity, and the other seven factors are not superseded or surmounted, but they are present along with right concentration. Okay, now the Buddha is going to turn back, so to speak, and take each of these factors and then explain, not all of them, but he's going to, well actually, when you look at it, it does turn into an account of all of the factors, but he's especially going to analyze the factors from right view through right livelihood. Okay, so now we start with right view. And so the Buddha says that right view comes first, or right view is called pubangama. I think that would be the Pali word that's used here. Yeah, it's Pubangama. I just write that. The word Pubangama is literally Puba means before or in front and Gama means going. And so now the Buddha is going to explain how right view comes first. And he says that 
one understands wrong view as wrong view and right view as right view. So even the ability to distinguish between what is wrong view and what is right view, that is one aspect of right view. Okay, now the Buddha's, this is a sort of the way the Buddha proceeds by introducing terms and then analyzing each term as he introduces it. So now he's spoken about wrong view and right view. So now he's going to give a kind of definition of each of these two terms. So he starts off now with wrong view. So what is wrong view? And then this is basically the view that denies karmic causation. So it's the view that there is nothing given, nothing offered, nothing sacrificed, which doesn't mean that if I give you something that I'm not actually giving it to you. But it's actually the view that there is no, say, karmic merit involved in the practice of giving, of making offerings, of practicing charity. That there's no fruit or result of good and bad actions. This is an explicit denial of karmic causation. There is no this world or no other world. Again, this is not a blanket denial of the existence of this world or another world, but it's the denial that for beings in this world, at death there's no passing to another world. That there's no mother, no father. <laughs> Again, it's not a denial that people are born <laughs> from their parents, but it's saying that there's no merit in providing for the well-being of one's parents, that we have no obligation to look after our parents. It's a kind of view that everybody should just take care of themselves and not even look after the people who have made the greatest sacrifices for oneself, one's own parents. No beings who are reborn spontaneously. This is the denial that there are beings reborn in other planes of existence who arise just through a spontaneous type of birth. And then, no good and virtuous recluses and brahmins in the world who have realized for themselves by direct knowledge the nature of this world and the other world and teach them to others. So this would be the view of those who look upon you know, the ascetics who have renounced the world, who are quite commonplace in ancient India, and thinking that they're just fools, they're missing out on the enjoyment of life. Why should they be devoting themselves, spending long hours sitting cross-legged in mountains and caves on the trees? And they could be out, you know, going to ballrooms and going to bars and enjoying themselves. They're missing all the good things in life. And they go out preaching and teaching and they're just deluding people, misleading them with all of their religious nonsense. You know, so this is all grouped together under this heading of wrong view. Okay, now we come to the really sort of interesting part of the sutta. Is it uh, being a recluse is wrong view or being a recluse? I don't follow that. So what he's saying, the, the, the one who holds this kind of wrong view, he's saying that there are no recluses and Brahmins in the world who have realized the real nature of this world and the world beyond and teach them to others. In other words, he's saying that, um, of course, he knows, since he's living in ancient India, he knows that there are recluses and Brahmins who have lived living lives of renunciation but he's saying that there's no kind of real experience of awakening, enlightenment, 
any kind of higher states of consciousness or realization to be achieved. And so when these ascetics claim that they've reach some kind of enlightenment, some kind of spiritual liberation, and are teaching about this to others. He says that they're just talking nonsense. Okay, so now that is wrong view. And wrong view is just presented here as of one type so of course in other suttas, other variations on wrong views are mentioned. But here now, when the Buddha introduces right view, this is where it becomes interesting. He makes a distinction. He says, a right view, I say, is twofold. There is a right view that is subject to the taints. Here we have affected by the taints partaking of merit. Right, first I'll read it, then I'll explain these terms, which are very technical. Partaking of merit, ripening in the acquisitions, and there is right view that is noble, taintless, without the asadas, super mundane, or world transcending, a factor of the path. Okay, so first let's take these terms. Anything else on this side? Then the other is noble. And super mundane, is that the next? And a factor of the path, is that the next? Taintless, right? Arya and Asana. Arya comes first. Oh, Arya comes first. It doesn't matter. Okay, now in the suttas that occur almost everywhere else within the Pali Canon, in the Sutta Bhitaka, when the Buddha is explaining the Noble Eightfold Path, he explains or defines right view simply as the right view of well, sometimes outside the context of the Noble Eightfold Path, when the Buddha speaks about right view, he speaks about the right view as given here, that's called the right view that's affected by the taints, that is the view that there is what is given, what is offered, what is sacrificed, there is fruit and result of good and bad actions, there is this world and the other world, 
There is mother and father, there are beings who are spontaneously reborn. There are in the world good and virtuous recluses and Brahmins who have realized for themselves by direct knowledge the nature of this world and the other world and teach them to others. So we find that kind of right view usually explained under the heading of the ten types of good karma. For example, in Sutta number 41 of the Matyamunikaya, where the Buddha is explaining the ten courses of wholesome karma, when he comes to right view, right view is explained in this way. But when the Buddha is speaking about the right view of the Noble Eightfold Path, then he defines it as the knowledge of suffering, of the origin of suffering, of the cessation of suffering, and of the path leading to the cessation of suffering. And in the context of the Noble Eightfold Path, no distinction is made about whether that right view is mundane or supermundane. It's just explained simply and directly as part of the path leading to the cessation of suffering. But here we see a distinction is made between the right view with taints that partakes of merit that is, this is the right view that leads to the acquisition of good karma that will promote a favorable or happy state of rebirth. And it's the right view which is said to be ripening in the acquisitions. That's upadi vipaka. And what is meant by the acquisitions here is the five aggregates. So this type of right view leads back into samsara. It's not the view that leads to liberation, directly to liberation. But it's the right view on the side of merit. It's a right view that will lead one to good fortune, a fortunate rebirth and fortunate circumstances within the cycle of rebirths. But now, when we come to the definition of right of the supramundane right view in this sutta, well, first we find a number of descriptive terms for this type of other type of right view, which are rather unique to this sutta. The, the word Arya is not particularly unique, but elsewhere in the suttas, when the word Anasava is used, it's used to describe the attainment of the arahat. So it's from the normal sutta standpoint, it's only the arahat who is called anasava, because what marks the achievement of arahatship is the elimination or the eradication of the asavas. And do you know what the asavas are the three most fundamental defilements. Anybody remember what they are? Uh, as, as for, uh, take take the microphone. Uh, yeah. Craving for sensual pleasure. Yeah. Craving for continued existence. Right. And ignorance. Right. Very good. Okay, so it's craving for sensual pleasures, or the asava of sensuality, the craving for continued existence, called the bhavasava, and it's the asava of ignorance. The word asava literally means flowing in, so sometimes it's translated influxes, but Venable Nyanamoli used taint. I don't actually like taint that much, but I continued, I just adopted Venable Nyanamoli's 
term. Okay, now will we come to the right view that's said to be noble, taintless, super, super mundane, a factor of the path. Notice the way it's being described here. We don't have it defined as the knowledge of the Four Noble Truths, but rather it's called the wisdom, the faculty of wisdom, the power of wisdom, the investigation of states, enlightenment factor, the path factor of right view in one whose mind is noble, whose mind is taintless, who possesses the noble path and who is developing the noble path. So what we see here first, one significant aspect of this definition is that the content of the right view is not mentioned, which is where this definition would differ from the standard definition of right view in the Noble Eightfold Path. For example, Sutta number 141, let me get the page number. Page 1100, paragraph 24, And what, friends, is right view? Knowledge of suffering, knowledge of the origin of suffering, knowledge of the cessation of suffering, knowledge of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. This is called right view. And if you look in countless other suttas, you'll find right view defined in exactly those terms. Okay, so here, the content of right view is not explicitly mentioned, but rather right view is being defined, we call this psychologically, in terms of a particular mental factor. And it's being identified with the mental factor of we call this panya or wisdom. And that it's not only explicitly identified with wisdom, but what is done in defining this type of right view is to take a number of synonyms for wisdom that occur in other contexts and group them all together under this definition of right view of this transcendent, world transcendent, or super mundane right view. So we have the faculty of wisdom. You probably have come across the five spiritual faculties. Anybody remember the five faculties? Who's speaking? Oh, you, you were speaking. Yeah. Okay, then take, take the microphone. Well, uh, I have to get them in the right order also. Uh, oh, <laughs> oh faith, uh, faith, empty, uh, oh, uh, mindfulness, uh, concentration, and uh, wisdom. Right, okay, so it's faith, energy or effort, mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. And so here, the text is taking the faculty of wisdom and making it a synonym of this world-transcending, noble right view. Then we have five powers. The five powers are, by name, they're the same as the five faculties. And so we're taking the power of wisdom and putting it under right view. Then we have seven factors of enlightenment, Anybody want to try the seven? Uh, Osmond, we'll try it. 
and the right order. <laughs> Call it tranquility. Okay. Um, uh, Excuse me. Effort. You had that already with energy, but you, you mentioned it, but you got it out of order. Concentration. Concentration. And then the last one. Equanimity. Right. Okay. So it's mindfulness, investigation of phenomena or states, energy, joy or rapture, tranquility, con concentration, equanimity. And so now the investigation of states, investigation of phenomena, enlightenment factor, is taken out and put under right view, the world transcending right view. Then we have the path factor of right view. So now this becomes the path factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. That is put under the right view that is noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path. And then we have some other interesting descriptions. The path factor of right view in one whose mind is noble. So now it's speaking about a particular state of consciousness. You see, that's quite distinctive of the Abhidharma mode of analysis. It's speaking about an Arya Chitta, a mind that is noble, a mind that is taintless, this is very significant because in everywhere else in the Sutta Vitaka, when they speak about the mind that's taintless, it's the mind of the Arahat. But here it's speaking about a mind, a chitta that is taintless, and yet it's not the chitta, the mind of the Arahat, because it says, it's the right view of one who possesses the noble path and is developing the noble path. Now, somebody who is an arahat is not developing the noble path. He's finished with the path. He's reached the end of the path. So this description here must be describing the state of mind or an experience of one who is still on the path, moving towards the goal. And yet, this is a mind that's described as taintless. And so this becomes a technical term in the Abhidharma to designate, to describe not the general state of mind of the Arhat, but to describe but are called the four world transcending path moments and the four, the corresponding four world transcending fruits. And so we see here what's emerging seems to be a different perspective on the path between the Sutta style of teaching and the Abhidhamma system. system systematization of the teaching. In the sutta style of teaching, we get the impression that one undertakes the practice of the Noble Eightfold Path by first acquiring a conceptual right view of the Four Noble Truths, then one begins undertaking the other path factors, and one practices in one's day-to-day -day life until, well, especially in concentrated sessions of meditation, until eventually one reaches liberation, the goal of the path, or until one reaches the four stages of awakening, culminating in the goal of the path. But now what takes place in the Abhidhamma is a distinction between two kinds of path, two aspects of the path. One is called 
I don't know if I should use the Pali words, the Lokya Mugga, which means the mundane path. For people who are relatively new to this class, I have to say this is a bit technical. <laughs> but we've been studying these suttas now for four or five years. <laughs> so I think those who have been coming regularly are ready for this level of teaching. Okay, so we have a distinction between what's called the Lokya, path, it's also called the preliminary or preparatory path. And then comes the Lokutra path. This means the world transcending path. And as the concept or the understanding of this world transcending path becomes refined in the Abhidhamma, it's conceived of as four mind moments which occur with some distance of time between them. But a world transcending path is just a single mind moment, a single moment of consciousness which rises up above and beyond the world of conditioned experience and penetrates the nature of Nibbana, the unconditioned Nirvana. And that world transcending path emerges from the development or cultivation of the mundane path, which is also called the preliminary or preparatory path. So in other words, the path that we are practicing in our day-to-day -day life, sometimes we say, I'm a Buddhist, I'm practicing the Noble Eightfold Path. But from the technical standpoint, maybe some of you are, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, but most of us are not. What we are doing is practicing a path, we could say that is in accord with the Noble Eightfold Path or we're practicing the preliminary or preparation for the Noble Eightfold Path. But the real Eightfold Path that is truly noble, truly world-transcending, is just that one moment of consciousness that arises when all of the spiritual faculties are mature, and that world-transcending path has the function of penetrating directly and deeply the Four Noble Truths by taking as its object of realization Nibbana itself. And when that path arises, it eradicates permanently, it eradicates certain of the defilements or the fetters that keep us in bondage to birth and death. And so there are four world transcending paths or stages in the world transcending path. Each one eradicates a certain layer of defilements until when one gets to the fourth world transcending path, it eradicates all the remaining defilements. And so those world transcending paths, those are called going from the lowest to the highest, the path of stream entry, the path of the once returner, the path of the non-returner, the path 
of arhatship. And then each path, each of these moments of consciousness that constitutes the path is followed by its fruition. That's, the fruition is also a state of consciousness in which one experiences momentarily the bliss of liberation from the particular defilements that have been eradicated by that path. And now that state of consciousness that is called the world transcending path, that is described as taintless, anasava, and noble. And so even though the person, the stream enterer, once returner, non-returner, have not yet eradicated the asavas or the taints completely. But those states of consciousness, because they have emerged from all conditioned mundane experience, and because they are taking nibbana as their object, they are said to be anasava, without the taints, without the influxes. Even though, say, the stream enterer will go through that experience, come down, as a stream enterer, he still has sensual desire, still has the craving for more existence, still has some ignorance. But that experience, that momentary experience of the path and fruit, those experiences are said to be free from the influxes, without the asavas. Okay, and so this right view, now, if we go back to the opening statement of the Buddha, he's saying that noble right concentration with its supports and its requisites is unification of mind equipped with these seven factors. And so the first of these is right view. And so now we see that what is being spoken of as the noble right concentration would be the concentration in that ex experience of the world transcending path and the right view accompanying that right concentration, that will be the right view that is called <coughs> noble, taintless, super mundane, a factor of the path. Okay, then the Buddha in the next passage, or the next paragraph, he brings in the other two factors that have not been mentioned yet, or two factors that have not been mentioned yet. One is right effort, the other is right mindfulness. So he says, one makes an effort to abandon wrong view and to enter upon right view, that is one's right effort then mindfully one abandons wrong view, mindfully one enters upon and abides in right view, that is, one's right mindfulness. Thus, these three states run and circle around right view, that is, right view, right effort, and right mindfulness. Okay, I have to explain the way I understand this that here I would understand the right effort and right mindfulness to apply in both paths, both types of path, but in different ways. In the mundane path, the preliminary or preparatory path, we are making a sort of conscious, deliberate effort to eliminate wrong view, and to acquire right view. So this is the kind of right effort that we experience in our ordinary day-to-day -day practice of Dharma. We have to sort of reflect and consider 
what is wrong view, what is right view. We study the text to see what is wrong view, what is right view. We reflect upon them. We do meditation, particularly insight meditation, in order to sharpen our right understanding or insight into impermanence, dukkha, non-self. So all of that effort is the right effort of the preliminary part of the path. And similarly, while we're making that effort, we're also practicing right mindfulness. And so we take up, could be mindfulness of breathing, mindfulness of the elements, mindfulness of walking back and forth, mindfulness of feeling, mindfulness of mental objects, mental states, anything within the framework of the four foundations of mindfulness will be the right mindfulness of the mundane path, the preliminary or preparatory path. But now, for somebody, when their practice comes to the culmination, when they reach the super-mundane, world-transcending path, that one mind moment, there's present energy involved in eliminating the defilements. That energy is the right effort of the world-transcending path. And there'll be the mindfulness, which is now helping to eradicate the tendency towards wrong view. That would be the world-transcending mindfulness, or the mindfulness in the world-transcending path. And then, of course, there's the presence of the right view itself. So he says, these three states, that is the right view, probably here the preliminary right view, and right effort and right mindfulness circle around, I think, the world-transcending right view. And now I want to show you something interesting, and then I'll open, open up the floor for discussion. First, I want to read Venable Analeo in this, that study of the, of the Sutta on the Great Forty. He's provided a translation of the Chinese version of the Sutta. But actually, this strikes me as a bit strange. Okay, the Chinese version, the way he translates it, he says, um, there is this noble right concentration with its arousing, its supports, and also with its equipment of seven factors. Then he says, I'll explain the seven factors are right view through right mindfulness. And then he says, right view is foremost. This would be like what I translate as the forerunner. If one sees that wrong view is wrong view, this is right view. If one sees that right view is right view, this is right view. Then what is wrong view? It's the view that there is no giving, no offerings, no sacrifice, no wholesome and evil deeds, no result of wholesome and evil deeds, and so on. But then he says, what is right view? It's the view that there is giving, there are offerings, there is sacrifice, there are wholesome and evil deeds. Um, there is this world and another world, there's obligation towards father and mother and so on. But that is it, and I have to say, this doesn't strike me as very satisfactory, because it's stopping with the right, with the mundane right view, 
just the right view of karma and its results, whereas this has to be a right view that goes along with the noble right concentration. In this way, I would have to say now that the Pali version is superior, even though it shows traces of later developments. I'll have to write a bit about Pali. I don't think he pointed that out. But this is what I found of interest. This is from the second book of the Abhidharma Vitaka. The book is called the Vibhanga. It's translated into English as the Book of Analysis. It's published by the Pali Text Society. And the, what the Book of Analysis does, it takes each of the major categories or doctrinal themes of the suttas, and then it presents each topic from two points of view. One is called the sutta point of view, the other is called the abhidhamma point of view. And so one chapter, chapter 11, is the analysis of the Noble Eightfold Path. The earlier chapters deal with the five aggregates, the twelve sense bases, the eighteen elements, four noble truths, dependent origination, other topics. But chapter 11, we have analysis of the path factors. Then we have first the analysis according to the suttas. So what is the Noble Eightfold Path? Right view to right concentration. Then what is right view? Knowledge of suffering, knowledge of the cause of suffering, knowledge of the cessation of suffering, knowledge of the way leading to the cessation of suffering. This is called right view. So this is in conformity with the many other suttas that we're familiar with. Then comes the analysis according to the Abhidhamma method. Okay, the eightfold path is right view, right thought, right speech, right action, to right concentration. What is the eightfold path? Okay, first factor we have is right view. Then what is right view? That which is wisdom, understanding, knowledge, the faculty of wisdom, the power of wisdom, the investigation of states enlightenment factor, the absence of dullness, the investigation of truth. Right view is a constituent of the path this is called right view. And so you could see the analysis according to the Abhidhamma is almost exactly the same as the explanation of this right view, this world transcending right view of the discourse on the great 40. And so it's an interesting question. There's two possibilities. One possibility is that the discourse on the great 40 represents a stage where the Abhidharma method of explanation is starting to emerge, but it's not yet been compiled into a formal system yet. And so these are sort of, you call these traces of Abhidharma method starting to emerge within the suttas, Maybe within the early Sangha there were discussions taking place and some of the teachers would start developing this more analytical method of explanation. And then some of those explanations then found their way into the Sutta Vitaka. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is that the Abhidharma already had emerged, at least in the elementary stage. And now, as the monks were looking back 
at the older suttas, they thought that maybe some of these definitions in the suttas are not precise enough, and so what they decided to do is to take material from the Abhidharma and put it into the suttas in order to give a more precise definition and distinction of the nature of some of these concepts introduced in the suttas. Yeah. This I have no way to decide between them. I think Venerable Anavayo tends to the view that the Abhidharma type ideas were starting to emerge and in this way they found their way into the suttas. But I'm not so sure that there's evidence that that view was against the view that the Abhidharma had already reached some degree of systematization and then Abhidharmic ideas were incorporated back into the suttas. I know this gets a bit technical and scholarly, but I think to understand what's going on in a sutta like this one has to bring in that information. If anybody has any questions, then please feel... Yeah, but please take the microphone. Thank you. Uh, one question. One is, uh, one refers to uh, Hirakuri and Kedukara, yeah. which, from my layman's understanding, it's very fundamental, yeah. uh, it's a fundamental, uh, uh, what you call, uh, right to... The topic or thing, yeah. Yeah, topic, yeah, and the important right. But that's not mentioned in this, uh, in that form. That's interesting, uh, yeah, that's I interesting. Understand. The second question is... Wait, let's take one at a time. Oh, okay. Of course, otherwise I'll forget the first question. If you ask an interesting second question, I might forget the first one. Yeah, that's a, an interesting and important point because, well, the commentaries distinguish... at least four aspects of right view. Okay, one is called the right view of karmic causation. That's like the right view that's given here, that there's merit in giving, making offerings, looking after mother and father. The second is called the right view of insight, and that would be the right view into impermanence, suffering, non-self. Then the third is the right view of the path, that's the world transcending right view in this momentary path consciousness. The fourth is the right view that's present in the fruition, there's a fifth right view, but I don't remember what it is. Okay, so it's interesting that that kind of right view is not mentioned here, but I would say that that right view, technically it would belong to the preliminary, preparatory path, but it's a higher type of right view than the right view of karma and its fruit. The second question is, Bhante, is the, all in respect to uh, the Mahayana tradition, yeah. which I, I I have no problem, we all came from the Buddha. Yeah. Uh, uh, Buddhism, I understand, went to China through Bodhidharma. Bodhidharma. Yeah. Oh, no, no, that's not the case. Uh -huh. Bodhidharma was the one who transmitted what came to be called Zen or Chan Buddhism to China. Yeah. But, but go on, continue. So, uh, I, so I believe it went in a little later into China. I'm not saying China, yeah. that yeah, yeah. it didn't come from, it didn't come from the same route. Yeah. But in China later, from there they say went to Japan and Korea. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, how the writing in the Theravada tradition is supposed to have come also directly from the time of Emperor Asoka or Buddha, yeah. from the Buddha to Asoka and to all over the world. Yeah. So, how you can say that the Chinese version is older than the. Oh, Theravada? okay. Yeah, this is important. Uh, it's a little confusing. Yeah, this is important and interesting point because one thinks <laughs> that. The Buddhism that's been practiced in China, it's predominantly Mahayana Buddhism. So then one might think, okay, the versions of the Agamas are Mahayana Buddhist texts. That's not the case, but they were actually, though classically they say, or traditionally, 18 schools of early Buddhism in India, in, you know, by the second century after the Buddha. Maybe the 18 didn't all have their own separate collections, but there were at least one, two, three, about four or five, about five different major schools which had their own collections of 
the Nikayas, also called the Agamas. So basically it's the same collection of texts. They're not Mahayana schools. They are text schools that fall within, sometimes they, I don't like to use the word Hinayana, which has a derogatory sense, but they fall under the scope, we'll call it, of early Buddhism. And so, you know, we shouldn't think that the Theravada has preserved the only exact, exclusive, faithful collection of texts, and the other schools got the texts, you know, jumbled up and distorted. But each school was preserving the original corpus of texts, and sometimes, because of the faults of, of the reciters, sometimes I think decisions were made collectively in groups of, of monks to add material, to rearrange material. So these are coming from early collections. It's just that are different lines of transmission of the same, what was originally the same collection of texts. In Chinese, maybe later than written in Pali. Um, of course, they were written in China later than the Pali scriptures were written in Sri Lanka. But the texts that were translated into Chinese and then written in Chinese would have come from the Majjhima Agama is traced, I believe, to the Sarvastivada school, which was the school that flourished in northwest India, around the area of Kashmir. And there's another school, which is called the Mula Sarvastivada, which flourished someplace in central India. Its text went to Tibet, and now there's, and also to China. And now there's, interestingly, there's a version of the sutta which came into, translated into Chinese, but it came into the Chinese version of the Sangyutta Nikaya, and it makes similar distinction that the Pali version does between the mundane and world transcending aspect of the path factors. Let me see if I could find that. Okay, Venerable Analio says, if I could read what he says, he says, notably, the If that's Venerable Anario, tell him I have something to tell him. Okay. He says, Notably, the Theravada tradition is not alone in making a distinction between mundane and supermundane path factors in its collection of suttas. A somewhat similar exposition can be found twice in the Sangyukta Agama, that's the counterpart of the Sangyutta Nikaya, a collection probably belonging to the Mula Savastivada tradition. Then he translates this sutta, which is called the Discourse on Right and Wrong. Okay, so the Buddha calls the attention of the monks, and then he says, what is right view? Right view is of two types. There is right view that is mundane with influxes, that's what the asavas, with grasping, I think that's upadi, that turns towards rebirth and a good destination. And there is right view that is noble, world transcending, without the asafas, without grasping, that eradicates suffering and turns towards the transcendence of suffering. Then what is the right view that is mundane with the asafas? That is the right view that there is giving, charity, offerings, and so on. And then what is the right view that is 
noble, world transcending, without influxes. This is when a noble disciple gives attention to dukkha as, or suffering as suffering, to its origin, to its cessation, and to the path. That is the right view. Oh, to the path, um, the investigation of dharmas, the discrimination, inquiry, realization, wisdom, awakening, and contemplative examination. That is the right view that is noble, world transcending, without the asafas, without grasping. So there we see almost the same kind of distinction made in this text, which has come to China, translated into Chinese, but from a different school than the Chinese Majjhima Agama, but which makes that same distinction as the Pali Sutta does. So, it, I mean, it's a quite a, a jumble for scholars to, to sort out. Okay, did somebody else have a question? It's Hector, okay. I was just wondering if you could date when the Abhidhamma may have influxed the Sutta. May have influenced it. Yeah. Well, I would assume that the Abhidhamma already existed as a separate system and then influenced it later. But I said that there's two possibilities. One is that the Abhidhamma had not yet formed a distinct system, but it was just a particular type of investigation and analysis that was taking place in an early stage in the development of, of Buddhism after the earliest period. And so, my, so if my understanding is that what came to be called the Abhidhamma would have developed probably with the Venerable Sariputta and the disciples of Sariputta continuing over several generations. So I don't know, you know, how much of the systematic Abhidhamma would have been introduced by Sariputta himself, how much by several late generations to follow. But I would guess already by the first century after the passing away of the Buddha, already Abhidhamic modes of analysis um, were, had already taken shape. This would be even before the schools went their separate way, I would say a basic foundation of Abhidhamic modes of thought had already emerged. Because when we compare the two major Abhidhamma systems, we could see certain similarities in the older strata of their texts. And then as the texts when we come to the later text, we can see the differences start to, to increase. So perhaps we could say that this version of the sutta, perhaps even by what's held to be the second council, or the third council, second council maybe 100 years, a little more after the passing of the Buddha, third council perhaps 150 years. But this is all very speculative. Thank you. Mate, uh, it's a question on right view. The Mate, right view. Yeah. In, uh, in the paragraph <coughs> when you mentioned about right view of karma, and yeah. the uh, effect of karma, and yeah. so on, doesn't that really? Uh, relate to our uh, fate because for an ordinary person like yeah. us, yeah. you know, uh, how can I see that's the right view? Because yeah. I can see. Yeah, karma. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's that's a, a sorry. That's an important point. So the question is whether acceptance of the teachings of karma and its result, that there's fruit or results of good and bad deeds. This isn't this a matter of faith rather than direct seeing? And I say that is the case. It's a matter of you're placing trust in the teachings, the statements of the teachers is coming down from the lineage of the Buddha. 
But the Buddha considers this, because he puts it under right view, is considered an aspect of having right understanding, even though it's not something that we can see directly for ourselves, but it's having, because it forms the foundation for the whole practice of the path, is having the understanding that our actions, our morally significant actions, generate this power or capacity to produce results that correspond to the ethical nature of those actions. So that wholesome actions, virtuous actions produce good or desirable results, and unwholesome actions, bad actions, produce undesirable, undesirable results. There's some idiots, they say sometimes it's small children. Yeah, I mean, there's sometimes there are some indications, at least for the reality of rebirth, at least one piece of evidence for this is the case of, this occurs more often in the countries in the East, where there is a belief in rebirth or reincarnation, that there are young children who, almost from the time they're able to form clear sentences, claim that they have, they tell their parents, oh, I have other parents who are living in such and such a village, and there I had maybe one brother and two sisters, and we lived, and they'll describe the house, and then they'll say that I was killed when I stepped out on the road when a bus was rushing by and I was run over or I fell into a well. And then there are some researchers, especially the late <coughs> Professor Ian Stevenson, who was at the University of Virginia Medical School, who used to investigate these cases and write them up. And he wouldn't take any cases in which some connection had been made between the family of the, new, of the child, the present family, and the old family. But where no connection was made, he would do investigations and often he would find that the old family would say that they would have two daughters and one living son, and they would say that they had a son who got run over by a bus or fell into a well and died. And so there are cases like that. You can find them. Ian e. Stevenson has published a large number of books. The most popular was called 20 Cases. I think, suggestive of reincarnation. Then he wrote, he compiled more specialized case studies into larger volumes. Why, why does it only happen to, to, to a few? The why does it happen to a few? Remember, uh, what, what seems to be, have a emerged fairly consistently, or at least predominantly in the cases that were studied by Ian e. Stevenson, it seems to happen most often when the person in the previous life had died prematurely, either from an illness or an accident. So it seems, this is my conjecture, I think, that the force of the consciousness, because they died as a child or an adolescent, the force of the consciousness was still pretty strong. And so, it continues over to the next, the next life. And because the person died by some accident or illness, so the memories of the previous life are still strongly imprinted on the consciousness. But I'd say that for us adults, I have enough trouble remembering where I put my other pair of glasses <laughs> yesterday. <laughs> How am I going to remember what I did in my last life? <laughs> of the spirits of the dead, 
They have to drink of the waters of the river of Leith, that's the river of forgetfulness, before they're able to descend back into the human world and take rebirth. Like if we had all of the memories from <laughs> our previous lives stored up, <laughs> we'd have to ask Henry to devise a fifty billion gigabytes computer, <laughs> and we'd, we'd spend the first eighty years of our life retyping all of the data <laughs> that we can remember so that we could have those memories at fingertips from the age of eighty to the year of our death. <laughs> so in order to be able to function effectively within this world, we have to clear off the slate of memory and start with a blank, a relative blank. Yeah, uh, actually mentioning um, Plato is a good segue to, to my comment. Um, and then I think this is very important, and I can see why the early Sangha um, started to differentiate between this mundane yeah, yeah, and yeah. super mundane yeah. path. Um, the mundane uh, teachings are really shared by other spiritual traditions, um, not to the exact extent. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, to what the Buddha outlined, yeah. but I think there's some shared vocabulary in regards to ethics, yeah. uh, etc. Yeah. Yeah. But this uniqueness of yeah. the yeah. Buddha's enlightenment, yeah. to yeah. really say that it's not all one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, That there is this difference, and yeah. this is the uniqueness that yeah. the Buddha yeah. gave to the human family. Um, so I think that that's, that's an important um, mm. point. Do you have any thoughts yourself on that? I mean, yes, that's definitely the case. And what is called here the right view that's affected by taints or the mundane right view, this would be not in any way like the unique possession of the Buddha's teaching. Exactly. Right. Like this would have been the shared understand or the, the shared or common right understanding amongst many of the spiritual communities of ancient India. Like it's considered almost like to be a decent and respectable person, one has to accept this kind of right view and to hold what is called the wrong view, that there's no results of giving, of making offerings, of good and bad deeds, that would you know, send out tremors in the minds of in India of the 5th century, like the designation atheist would in a small town in Iowa or Missouri. <laughs> and what I like yeah. about the teaching on the mundane right view is that yeah. it does give us common ground and vocabulary yeah. with speaking with other uh, traditions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but, you know, the subtleties, and this is where it's so yeah. important, and I've been uh, reflecting on um, like Sakaya Ditchi, yeah. uh, for example, yeah. that it's a fetter, but it's really, you know, in some ways not a defilement because mm. the, you know, not having the understanding of Sakaya Ditchi yeah. doesn't mean that you can't be born in a Brahma world. Yeah, that is actually the case. That is the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is where it becomes so subtle because I yeah. think it's, yeah. it's hard to really communicate this difference. Yeah. the uniqueness of the teachings of the Buddha. Yeah, yeah. But one thing I, I, I was intending to add, that even teachings which are, which are considered quite unique to the Buddha, especially the three characteristics, well, impermanence and suffering, you could say, are to some extent shared by other spiritual traditions, maybe not as radically and as thoroughly as with the Buddha's teaching, but the teaching of non-self, so taking the three characteristics as a group, impermanence, suffering, non-self, those are, you say, as a set unique to the Buddha's teaching, and yet the contemplation of them or the insight into them is still put into the preliminary preparatory path. That was so helpful for me because yeah. I really saw that, so that's still a mundane preliminary... Yeah, we call yeah. it mundane 
the word mundane, it doesn't quite have the same connotations as the word mundane does in English, where mundane means something which is just ordinary, everyday, commonplace. But this is mundane used in a rather technical sense, meaning it pertains to the world of the five aggregates. Yes. Uh, actually, you know what, just keep in mind was in the second foundation of mindfulness with Vedna, how there's that um, uh, uh, kind of teasing out of worldly sensations or Vedna, and then I believe you translated it as spiritual, yeah. uh, which is an ethical dimension, actually, yeah. of the, yeah. the Vedna. Yeah. But even in the second foundation of mindfulness and the distinction in the feelings, what's called niramisa, which was translated spiritual, or literally it's non-carnal, okay. is not, it's probably not intended to be the world transcending, but it, it's just feelings that are free from sensuality, whereas the Carnal, or how do we call them? How did I translate it? Uh, worldly. <laughs> worldly. The yeah. worldly feelings right. are feelings which are bound up with either sensuality or with ordinary mundane concerns, you know, relations with family members, job, wealth, and so on. Yeah, that's why I was wondering if it could have connected to that preliminary um, manga, that kind of not truly mundane, the way it was described in the beginning, but... Um, yeah, all of those feelings, both the worldly and the spiritual feelings, still would come under the, the mundane in this sense. Thank you. Anybody else have question, comment? We still have about five minutes left, and I don't want to go into another path factor. Did, Hector, did you have a simple question? But... Okay. Um, It's a very makeshift rendering. It's very hard to render exactly into English. Okay, what is translated as the acquisitions here is the word upadi. Upadi means the sense is that which is taken up or that which is used as a basis or as a foundation. And so the foundation or the basis, so to speak, are the five, the five aggregates that constitute conditioned existence. The body, the body, feelings, perceptions, the volitional formations and consciousness. So, this type of right view is said to ripen in the acquisitions in the sense that it leads back into the realm of birth and death, back to acquiring a new set of five aggregates. But since it's a right view, it will lead to acquiring the five aggregates or a new existence under fortunate or favorable conditions. And so sometimes, like the state of liberation is called nirupadi, which means the absence of acquisitions or freedom from the acquisitions. Neuroto or neuroto, is that cessation? Is the word? Um... 
Yeah, nirota is sensation, but that's cessation, but that's a different word from nir. Oh, yeah. yeah. The prefix nir has a negating sense, usually absence of. But nirota is actually ni plus rota, not nir plus oda. Okay, so I think then we'll stop for the. Okay. Um, one day again is the question on view. Um, how does how with a view? How can you eliminate those defilements? Uh, uh, with the view, how does one eliminate the defilements? With the right view, of course. This is actually a big question. So. <laughs> Um, why don't we save that question for the discussion period, if you'll be coming back. Okay, of course, now we're going to take a break for the lunch, then we come back here. Let's let you take the lunch a bit leisurely. So we'll come back, we'll meet at 12.30, then we can have a half an hour for discussion. So then you, ra- you get the first crack at a question when we come back. Okay, so we end with the sharing of the merits. I think she handed out the, um, the sheets with the verses. So this is to share the merits with the devas, the deities, the bhutas, the fear spirits, the nagas, that's the rain spirits, and other beings wishing that they rejoice in our merits, and that they protect the world, protect the Dharma, protect ourselves and others. Akasata Chabumata Deva Nagamitika Bunyanta Nanumoditva Chirang Rakantu Sasanam Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyanta Nanumoditva Chirang Rakantu Desanam Akasata Chabumata Deva Naga Mahitika Punyanta Nanumoditva Chirang Rakantu Mangparam Eta Vatacham Hehi Sampadang Punya Sampadang Sabe deva numodantu, Sabha sampati siddhya, Eta vatacha amhehi sampadang punya sampadang, Sabe bhuta numodantu, Sabha sampati siddhya, Eta vatacha amhehi sampadang punya sampadang, Sabe satanumodantu, Sabha Sampati Siddhya Bhava Gopadaya Vichy Heta To Etantare Satakayupapana Rupia Rupicha Sanya Sanino Dukha Pamuchantu Pusantu Nibuting Okay, we can end with three half hours. Was this too technical, by the way? Okay, we start off, and I start off in a state of debt since I have to answer Tsering's question, the question he brought up just at the very end of the main session, and that is how right view 
helps to eliminate wrong uh, defilements. As I said, it's a pretty big topic, pretty big area, because there are different levels of right view and different levels of defilements. So let's say one level of defilement is the level where they motivate unwholesome action, you know, unwise, unskillful action. So when one has the right view of karma and its results, then one understands that if one engages in unwholesome actions, immoral, un unskillful actions, that they're going to bring some kind of undesirable consequences to oneself. Whereas if one follows the, for example, the 10 types of wholesome action, you know, of wise action, you know, not killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, false speech, and so on, then it's going to bring favorable results. So with this right understanding of karma and its results, then it will give you some motivation for restraining the defilements that tend to break out and to motivate unwholesome action. Okay, then if one has with the right view of insight, let's say, the right view into the three characteristics, impermanence, suffering, non-self, this will help to control attachment and also maybe to control the tendency to swing between the two. Usually our minds swing between the two extremes of getting excited and joyful and then attached to the pleasant things and then getting upset and miserable and dejected when we meet with disagreeable situations. You know, so if we get praised, then we're happy, I'm the greatest. If we get blamed, criticized, oh, I feel so miserable. <laughs> if we get wealth, then we feel like we're the king of the world. If we lose the wealth, then we get miserable. But if we have the right view, say, just of impermanence, then we know that this is the nature of the world, things are changing. So if we get wealthy, we get praised, we get fame, whatever, then we don't get elated because we know it's impermanent. <laughs> and then if we get, <clears throat> um, if we meet with misfortune, misery, poverty, criticism, and so on, then we don't get upset because we, as long as we're doing the right thing, then we just know that this is the nature of the world and this is impermanent too. Maybe it will change. And at any rate, because we have the right view of non-self, you know, we don't refer this to ourself thinking, if I accomplish something worthwhile, that I'm great, I'm important, I'm the big shot, <laughs> the big fish. <laughs> and if, you know, we're not so successful in what we're doing, then we don't take it out on ourselves. We don't feel that I'm worthless, I'm good for nothing, I'm a failure. But we just recognize we have some good qualities, bad qualities, skills in some areas, shortcomings in other areas, and we just make the effort to improve ourselves. So based on this right view. And so that way we get rid of you know, clinging to the pleasant and aversion, fear, worry about the unpleasant. So that's the right view of insight. Just a few examples. And then with the right view, the super mundane or the world transcending right view, that is the right view that at the deepest level cuts off the defilements so that they can't arise again. So with each of the four different levels of right of realization, one cuts off a certain layer of defilements. And then once those layers of defilements are cut off, it said that they're cut off at the root, unable to arise again. After the class, people are coming up to me and saying, what about this, what about that? <laughs> so I say, let's leave it for the discussion period. <laughs> Mante, can you, uh, I never 
really thought about it, obviously, but um, the two views, the view um, for the preliminaries and the uh, yeah. world transcending. And the preliminary, is that what leads to Sotapatthana? Uh, is it what leads to a Sotapatthana? Okay, what we find in the suttas when the definitions of right view are, are, are given in most of the suttas, just accepting this one, we find two ways of explaining right view, usually two ways. One is the very, what we'll call this the very basic preliminary right view, which is the right view of there is giving, there is offering, there is charity, there is good results of good and bad deeds, there is the responsibility to mother and father, there's this world, the other world. So this we could just call the right view of karma and its fruit. So that is the very basic preliminary right view. And then the other way right view is normally explained in the suttas is in the context of the Noble Eightfold Path, where it's explained as understanding suffering, its origin, its cessation, and the path. So that's the right view of the Four Noble Truths. Some other passages in the suttas also give, as a right view, the understanding of the th three characteristics about impermanence, suffering, non-self. So the way I would group them or classify them. Okay, the right view of karma and its fruit, as I said, is the very basic preliminary right view. The right view of insight, of the three characteristics, impermanent suffering, non-self, this is still considered, in this scheme, it's still considered preliminary or preparatory because it's still working with the, in the world of the five aggregates. Though it's, of course, it's deeper than the right view of karma and its results. But it is that right view of insight into the three characteristics, which is leading up to the world transcending right view. So that's as the practice of insight gets deeper and sharper and clearer, when all of the person's spiritual faculties are mature, then it will break or emerge into the world transcending right view. One reaches the world transcending path, and then at the leading that path is the right view of realization. That would be the right view of, at the first level, the right view of the street of stream entry, of the path of stream entry. But then there's the question, what about the right view of the Four Noble Truths that's mentioned as the standard definition in relation to the Noble Eightfold Path? <clears throat> I would say that we can understand the right view of the Four Noble Truths at two levels, the preliminary level and the world transcending level. At the preliminary level, the right view of the Four Noble Truths it's first the right view that we acquire conceptually through study of the teaching, reflection on the teaching. Then we get an intellectual right view of the Four Noble Truths. Then as one practices insight meditation, then this right view of the Four Noble Truths becomes experiential. And it's still within the broad class of preparatory right view. But now it's becoming the experiential understanding of the Four Noble Truths. But still, because it's dealing with insight into the five aggregates, it's still in the preliminary stage. But then when that right view of the Four Noble Truths emerges, so that one is directly seeing the ultimate truth, that is Nibbana, Nirvana, then it becomes the world transcending right view. And at that point, one understands all Four Noble Truths simultaneously. Can you have, you can't have right view 
right to be without right concentration. You can't have right concentration without right view or because why did the Buddhists start out uh, in the sorry when when it said uh, uh, is noble uh, right concentration with its supports and its requisites? Well, here when the Buddha is speaking about noble right concentration, when we look at this discourse as a whole, it's pretty clear that he's speaking about the world transcending right concentration, which when it arises, this would be the concentration which is fixed on Nibbana, and it arises together with the factors, the other factors of the Noble Eightfold Path simultaneously, present simultaneously. But in terms of day-to-day -day practice, one can have, certainly one can have right view of the very basic right view of the understanding of karma and its fruit without having right concentration. Not to speak about the world transcending right concentration without even the jhana experience. One can have that right view and one could be building up the right view of insight. Of course, for the insight knowledges to arise, one needs some degree of concentration but that concentration doesn't have, have to be very deep or, or profound to have the right view of insight. But it's when the work for the world transcending right view to occur, it has to occur simultaneously with the right concentration. Because that's the right concentration of the really noble world transcending path. Okay, Bowie has a question. When taking your explanation of the right energy and right mindfulness, you also include the uh, two levels. Is the super mundane level uh, described in the sutta, or you just supplemented it from the Abhidhamma or uh, the commentaries? Okay, she's asking whether the super mundane level of right effort and right mindfulness are described in the sutta. Interestingly, if you've read the whole sutta, you see that it goes up in its analysis of the path factors only through right livelihood. And so it doesn't give a separate explanation of right effort, right mindfulness, or right concentration. And so just in my understanding or interpretation, I would say that right effort and right mindfulness also have to function at the two levels. The level of, in conjunction with the preparatory path, where there's the effort to overcome wrong view and to acquire right view. And mindfulness that accompanies the elimination of wrong view and acquiring right view. So that would be right effort, right mindfulness of the preliminary or preparatory stage. And then there will be, together with the breakthrough experience of realization, the world transcending path, that has to have right effort and right mindfulness. So that would be the world transcending right effort and right mindfulness. In fact, I think one of these... Yeah, it's the Tibetan version of this Mahachattarisika Sutta. Has these formal definitions of right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. And interestingly, it uses the Abhidharma type of method of explanation for these three factors. 
like what is right effort, um, endeavoring, not, you know, it's just like a string of synonyms, endeavoring, not procrastinating, exertion, endeavoring, non-discouragement, not becoming easily satisfied, this is right effort. Then what is right mindfulness? Whatever mindfulness there is, recollection, various kinds of mindfulness, non-forgetful mindfulness, <laughs> absence of forgetfulness, sustained noting of the mind, this is reckoned as right mindfulness. Then what is right concentration? The calm dwelling of the mind, still abiding, manifest still abiding, essential still abiding, non-distraction, right collectedness, tranquility, concentration, one-pointedness of the mind, this is right concentration. So that is really almost like straight out of the Abhidhamma system. But you could actually see from these kind of definitions how the Abhidhamma, at least in the early stage, would have emerged. It would come by taking the terms, the words used in the suttas, and then finding from the Indian vocabulary of the period, just like string, the string of, like a thesaurus, giving a whole bunch of other synonyms for that term. So that it could be perhaps making it intelligible for people who would understand through a different term than the standard passage uses. Hangzhou, that's your name. Could you give me, uh, what's an example of uh, wrong concentration? You know, this is somewhat interesting that even though the eight wrongnesses are mentioned in the suttas, of course we have a definition of wrong view, but the definition of wrong view is the denial of karma causation. But we don't have a definition of wrong view, which is the opposite of the view of the Four Noble Truths. It's a bit of a puzzle. We do have definition of wrong intention, wrong speech, wrong action, wrong livelihood. I think there's no formal definition of wrong effort, wrong mindfulness, and in most cases, no definition, formal definition of wrong concentration, except there's one sutta, number 108, where the word used is not concentration, but jhana, meditation. Would it be concentration on, or meditation on, on wholesome? Yeah. Well, I'll, we'll look at the passage together. Um, this is on page 885. This is after the Buddha's passing away. Venerable Ananda is having a conversation with a Brahmin. And the Brahmin praises the Buddha. He says, the, the Buddha Gautama was a meditator and he praised every type of meditation. <laughs> but then Ananda says that the Buddha didn't praise every type of meditation. And then he says, what kind of meditation did the Buddha not praise? And then he says, someone dwells with his mind, obsessed by sensual lust. He harbors sensual lust within. Then he meditates, pre-meditates, out-meditates, mis-meditates. Then he abides with his mind, obsessed by ill will, the mind obsessed by sloth and torpor the mind obsessed by restlessness and remorse, obsessed by doubt, and then he meditates, out-meditates, pre-meditates with the mind obsessed by doubt. So basically it would be, 
the mind which is overrun by the five hindrances, except that normally we don't think of that uh, the five hindrances as distractions or obstacles to concentration, not forms of concentration. But maybe we could understand that to be wrong concentration. But, you know, not looking at the suttas, but just using our sort of reflection, we could think maybe a general who's planning a strategy in war might have like his whole mind absorbed in the strategy. We send this battalion there, or this platoon there, that platoon here, and we have aircraft coming above, bombing. You know, somebody comes in and says, General, your tea is ready. He doesn't even hear. He's just so absorbed in, you know, planning the st- strategy for the, for the battle. And then maybe we have the Don Juan or Casanova who's <laughs> seeing a, a beautiful new woman. And so he's sitting at his desk thinking about the new woman and imagining her in his mind's eye and he's completely absorbed in his thoughts of her. (laughs) So that might be a kind of concentration, wrong concentration. Okay, what is your name by the way? My name is Paul. Paul. Usually, Venerable um, Anadlio will uh, do a um, kind of condense the the suttas he's reviewing and to see the commonality yeah. of. Um, in this case, it sounds like there's three um, suttas that. He, um, Actually, he covers one, two, three. I think that there were four altogether. Okay. Three I know from it's, Chinese, one from Tibetan. I know you just started the sutta, but could you share a little bit on his findings um, between the four uh, um, comparisons? I think I covered pretty much the essential points already. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay, good. Because right, just the discussion of right view illustrates what's the essential difference is that the sutta, which is the Chinese parallel to the Mahachatur, to the Great Forty, doesn't make the distinction in the right factors between the mundane right factor and the world transcending right factor. It just uses pretty much the standard definitions that we find in other suttas of the eight factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. So that is the direct parallel, Chinese parallel, to the Pali version. But there are two other suttas that come in the Chinese Sangyutagama, that's the parallel to the Sangyutta Nikaya. That's the one called the Sutta on Right and Wrong, which do make the distinction. I read that passage on Right View. They make the distinction, very similar distinction, between the preliminary preparatory right view and the world transcending right view. And then there's a Tibetan version, which, as I said just a few minutes ago, defines, additionally it defines right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration using the string of Abhidhamma type synonyms. But as a, I mean, his paper here, it's pretty dense and covers a lot of material. So I just, well, somebody asked me to write the title on the board. I'll do that when we finish the discussion. Or you could just come up and copy right off here. Uh, the Tibetan uh, definition of uh, right effort uh, sa- didn't sound like the traditional uh, definition of right effort, which is the really focuses on, on wholesome and unwholesome. Yeah, yeah. That's why I said that this is 
not a sutta style of definition, yeah, right. but this is the kind, the way that definitions come in the Abhidharma. Right. Let me just jump the gun. Where did I put it? Yeah, this is from the Vibhanga. This is the Pali Abhidharma work, um, where they're analyzing the path factors according to the Abhidharma method rather than the Sutta method. Then it says, what is right effort? That which is the arousing of mental energy. Then this particular passage has been condensed or abridged because the definition has come earlier. But it comes in the string of synonyms that which is the arousing of mental energy, probably it will say things like mental energy, being energetic, applying energy, striving, applying oneself, endeavoring, and then ending the enlightenment factor of energy, the path constituent of energy, right effort. This is called right effort. So it's a similar way defining in terms of a series of synonyms. And very similar to the Tibetan yeah, exactly. uh, definition. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Okay, we'll have time for one more question. Pante, um, it's a question on right views again. With the right views, you explain that it's related to the understanding of the three characteristics yeah. and also in uh, the Four Noble Truth. Yeah. Could you please uh, explain how these three characteristics are related to the Four Noble Truths? Briefly, I think I would say that the three characteristics would be ways of looking at the noble truth of suffering. So we have the three characteristics impermanence. So things are subject to arising and passing away. That's the meaning of impermanence. And because things are subject to arising and passing away, they are dukkha which doesn't mean literally suffering, but unsatisfactory or defective. And so that connects directly to the noble truth of suffering, or the noble truth of dukkha. And then things are not self, and yet we cling to things as being I and mine, myself. And so that causes frustration, dissatisfaction, worry, concern. So many manifestations of suffering come from clinging to a self. And so we could say that non-self becomes a way of counteractive to the suffering that comes from clinging to thoughts or ideas of I and mine. So in that way it relates to, on the one hand it relates to the noble truth of suffering, but also contemplation of impermanence suffering and non-self come under the superior preliminary right view. And so in that way, they will relate to the fourth noble truth as part of the fourth noble truth, the objects of insight or the topics of insight that are to be developed in order to, to bring to maturity the right view of the noble eightfold path. Okay, so that will be our class for today. So let's end with three half bows to the Buddha. Oh, I didn't look at the... Oh.
the question was so this question is you was asked before and you say you were gonna write the name of the book on the board. Yeah, I'll do that. <laughs> He'll have to be patient. <laughs> we give him an opportunity to practice patience. <laughs> Okay, I'll write the name of the book. Yeah, because it's published by a Taiwan publisher, so in the U.S., I guess the best way to get a copy is through the distributor, the Chan Meditation Center in New York. You look that up on the internet. It's in Queens, yeah. Excuse me? Oh, you inquired already. Really? From the, the, the New York Center? Um, or from Taiwan? From Taiwan. Wow. So maybe it's by now a second printing has come out. I don't know. But anyway, in, t in time, I think a se second printing will appear. Okay, so we end with three half bows. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> 